You're listening to another episode of the Fredericksburg Strong Podcast. This is a local forum to inform and entertain our community, discuss local news, promote small businesses, and celebrate our hometown heroes with a little dose of humor to keep you entertained. Our mission is simple, to keep Fredericksburg strong. Today's podcast is powered by Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai of Fredericksburg. And now, here's your host, Tim Pohanka. Hello, everybody. It's Tim Pohanka, and welcome to Fredericksburg Strong. I have a guest that I have tried to get on here for a long time, and we finally caught him. I don't know how we did. I, I'm grateful that he stopped by. Tim White, Stafford for Food Security. How are you? Good, good. A little busy, a little busy, but hey, we made some time to come in today. Every, you know, you say you're a little busy, but I don't know anyone who's really not right now. No, it's, a fair, it's a fair statement. I mean, uh, you know, it, when you think about wherever, how everyone's working and what's going on, we're all busy just trying to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a confusing time right now. Mm -hmm. Now, because, you know, in your real job, you work for the government, right? I do, yeah. I work, uh, I work for the Department of the Navy out at Naval Surface Warfare Center. Dalton. Okay. So, you know, you've got a real job mm -hmm. on top of what we're about to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that's been an interesting time just talking about your going out to working your real job during this time period right now. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been interesting. Um, fortunately, uh the answer for us was telework, right? So so that means I don't have to drive out to Dahlgren every day. So it actually frees me up for a couple of hour days just in commute time. Um, but uh, you know, I, my particular job is I teach leadership and I, I help with training and education, um, which is a little hard to do right now when we can't gather. So we've been uh, dealing with the challenges of virtual training and how to work together in a virtual environment, um, which fortunately for me, that's not new to me because Prior to that, you know, I was in the Marines and I spent a lot of time deployed where we do long distance communication all the time. So um, we've been using some of those lessons learned and, and dealing with it that way. So it, uh, it's been challenging, but it's been kind of eye opening too, because I think more and more people are becoming aware that people really can work from home and people really can telework. So I think that may be one of the good changes that comes out of this is that people will understand better how to communicate and work together in a remote environment and there's going to be a lot of lessons learned from that but we have learned some other things when you mm -hmm. look at well number one let's say this is that you, you now feel teachers pain oh yeah absolutely. you know exactly what oh, our yeah. teachers are going through but when you look at the other part that we've learned the internet is not the same in this country depending upon where you live oh absolutely yeah i see yeah i see what you, you, know, you know that's been a that's been a huge thing when you're talking about you know, remote learning and remote education or teleworking, teleworking, I mean, if you don't have the right internet access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see it, uh, especially with our folks that work out in King George. Uh, uh, they, there's not good internet in a lot of King George. And they're right, next to, the, and they're right next to the base. Yep. <laughs> I mean, yep. We actually had to pull in, uh, there, there was a Verizon service that came in and boosted our signal out there for, for a little while, you know, but that's not helping people out in the rural areas. Uh, there's definitely some, some challenges with access to internet um, that I hope are gonna be addressed very soon. I know Congressman Whitman was working on mm -hmm. some different packages and stuff like that. That's something I've been following pretty closely, um, especially as it relates to the kids, you know. Um, Stafford, uh, Stafford County I've been working with really closely. They've been handing out Khajiits and hotspots and things like that to help some of that, but even those don't work in some of the areas. And I was actually no, uh, just talking to Kim Austin from Kate Waller Barrett last night, and they found out that when they handed out those Khajiits, as soon as you turn on the microphone and the speakers at the same time, pff, it's dead. So yeah. now they're looking at new solutions. I mean, I, I go to Stafford, I go to Hope Springs Marina, and mm -hmm. you can't get cell phone reception in that one section right down in that, 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 down that hill. And that's in the heart of Stafford County, right by the courthouse and all those things. Mm -hmm. You know, but that remote learning, you're talking about remote learning and, and the challenge they have there kind of goes into what you're here really to talk about is the challenges of now everyday life for people, who, you know, who may not have their internet access. They go to school to get the things that they need, mm -hmm. education, a break from some of the non-traditional family experiences that they may be having. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, that's also where their first meal may come from. Absolutely. So um, the... A lot of kids, the food that they get at school may be the only meal they get in a day. You know, that, that free lunch or, or 
reduced lunch even, um, may be the only food that they get. You know, so that's one of the reasons why we started Stafford Food Security was we wanted to help those families that needed a little help with food. Maybe they need, you know, we particularly focus on dinners. So our program, uh, if those that aren't familiar with it, we've, we've always, for the last three years, we've put backpacks in the schools that contain dinner for a family of four. And then when a teacher sees a kid that, you know, she thinks is hungry, there's some food insecurity in that home, she can take one of these backpacks and send it home and say, hey, your family's eating dinner tonight. And then we try to connect them with some other resources. Um, but I, I, my, I partnered with the schools right off the bat because they have access to all these kids. And I can put the backpacks in the schools and it's just, bam, instant connection. There's a need at the school, send food home with the kids, and we, we feed the family. But with school being out right now, that shot a hole in my whole distribution system because kids aren't in school, they can't get the backpacks. So before you go yep. further, I want to make sure that we touch base on something that, that I learned and I think it's important. When you say you're giving a backpack with a meal, mm -hmm. you're not giving a backpack with cheese whiz. No, absolutely not. You're, you know, it's not, a, it's not just, hey, here's the items that were going to be expired at the at the at the supermarket so you got you know tomato soup cheese whiz some crackers and 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 maybe a, a capri sun in there you're we're talking it's a real nutritious based meal absolutely yeah they're full up meals um we, we do have to keep them shelf stable because they're stored in the school and, and there's some uh, handling considerations there but um, working with shelf stable stuff i've come up with uh, our five core meals that we do that are you know things like tuna casserole red beans and rice um, we do beef stew we do uh chick white chicken chili and a, oh, and a mac and beans meal which is kind of a fun one for the kids because what kid doesn't love mac and beans you know mm -hmm. um so but each meal will have enough to feed a family of four. Um, and then we'll put in some fruit cups to add some extra fruit and nutrition. We'll put in some granola bars for some extra carbs. And then we use 100% juice only, because uh, that's an important distinction, because a, a regular Capri Sun is just sugar water. Yeah. But the 100% juice ones actually add half a serving of fruit. So they're getting a couple servings of fruit, they're getting the vegetables, they're getting everything that they need. And then everything is in there that they need. So like the beans and rice, uh, I don't want you to just eat beans and rice. I throw in some Saison Goya seasoning packets in there and we make sure that they have everything they need to season it up. Uh, the tuna casserole, we make sure that they've got the crackers to crumble up and put on the top because that's how I would eat it at home and I try yeah. to feed them the same way I would feed my family. So it's about a, it's a dignified meal. Absolutely. It's not, it's not you know, sitting out and just finding whatever's left over and making surprise as a surprise meal. And I think that's important. And then you also include, you were talking about help information. Mm -hmm. Because it, because again, if you, it's great. You've given them a meal. Yep. A meal doesn't solve it doesn't solve do problem. A lot. Yep. So talk about that. Sure. So uh, working with our school partners, uh, what I'll do is I'll come up with a list of food pantries that are in their area and say, hey, you know what? Because because we're not meant to be long term. It's it's a it's an immediate need. Uh, the goal would be, you know, let's say on Monday, you know, Mrs. Smith meets Johnny and identifies that he's hungry. So you know what, Johnny, we're going to get you an appointment with a social worker. Well, that might be Wednesday. And then on Wednesday, the social worker says, yep, Johnny, you need help. We're gonna get you some food. And then maybe that happens by Friday. But what happens between Monday and Friday? You know, the, well, Johnny's hungry. So we're there to fill that gap in the meantime. So maybe they get four of our backpacks in a week, or maybe they need help a couple of times. We'll help them more than once, but we wanna make sure that we're connecting them to other resources. And our food pantries are tremendous. I mean, organizations like Serve or uh, uh, the table at St. George, and there's there's a ton of food pantries in the area. So we want to make sure that people know that they're there. Um, and so we'll put that information inside the pack, say, hey, here's their hours, here's when they're open. Um, and then the goal of the backpack is really to help the teachers or the counselors or the social workers build a relationship with that family. So once you come with a meal in hand and say, hey, we're here to help, that opens the door. Maybe they find out that the reason they're hungry is because dad lost his job. So maybe we can help connect them to an employment service or something like that. Or maybe it's something a little more deeply concerned. Maybe there's some, out, uh, some chemical abuse or some kind of mental issue there. Now we're not gonna deal with that, but the school will work, we'll work with them to connect them to resources that can. And then hopefully we can find out what the underlying problem is and work to fix it from there. And, and that's that's a key differential between other groups who, you know, you're just giving, just mm -hmm. giving, just giving. This is truly about okay. We're not going to just going to we're not going to boost you up. 
we're going to let you pick yourself up. Right. Absolutely. That, that's 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 important to me. You know, I mean, I, I think you and I have talked a little bit. You know, I grew up in in these communities. I grew up very poor. Uh, was on my own at 15, homeless for a little while, and then you know, eventually I worked my way out of it. But I didn't do that alone. I had some people along the way that taught me some very valuable lessons. Um, you know, I remember I was couch surfing with one kid, uh, my buddy Ryan. And it was a Saturday morning. I wake up on the couch, and his dad's walking through. And I was like, hey, sir, you know, I'm eating your groceries. I'm sleeping on your couch. Can I go, like, mow your lawn or something? So, of course, the first thing he says to me is, like, my own kid doesn't mow the lawn. He's like, what? You know, and they were a pretty well-to-do okay. family. Um, so I mowed the lawn, and I came back in. I said, hey, sir, you got anything else? And he's like, what's your deal, man? I said, well, you know, I said, I, said, I can't go back home. There's some things going on there. I said, I've got to make it on my own. I said, but I, I hate taking handouts from people, so I'd rather earn my way. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He says, come work at my store a couple days a week. He had This guy was a self-made, I don't know how wealthy he was, but he was pretty wealthy to me at the time. Yeah. He built a rainbow vacuum dealership from scratch, okay. you know. Um, this is, of course, this is dating myself a little bit. It's back in like the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, so I, I did. I worked with him a couple days a week. I'd clean up the shop. He'd show me about vacuum. I never sold rainbow vacuum cleaners, but he taught me things like it's not enough to work hard. You have to save money. He says, so when, so when I pay you at the end of the week, make sure you save some of that money. And, and then he taught me, uh, you know, the best part about Ryan's family was his mom and dad were divorced, but they were both, they got along really well. But every Thursday, uh, Ryan and I would go to his mom's house for dinner. And when we went there, she made us wear a shirt and tie, which I didn't have a shirt and tie, but they taught me how to tie a tie, tie, little things like that, you know. But when we got there, his mom would have this feast set out, but there were like 27 forks and spoons and everything else. And she taught me how to, how to eat like a civilized person, you know. Now, 16 years old, I didn't see the importance of that. But fast forward 10, 15 years later, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I'm at a, a business setting and I see this whole spread and some of my companions are like, dude, what do we do? And I'm like, start from the outside, work your way in, don't lean over your bowl. And they're like, how do you know this stuff? You know? <laughs> that's like, the chilled salad fork. <laughs> exactly, you know, the shrimp fork. You know, yeah, the that's salad. the shrimp fork. So, you know, you work your way in. and uh, But it was interesting because some of those guys were very uncomfortable and they didn't engage with some of the people there. It was a political function I was at, actually. That's what it was. Um, and so I had people come up to me and talk to me that normally I would never interact with because I was from this side of town. They were from that side of town. But since I blended in well and I had some manners and different things like that, it actually led me to some sales and some work and some different things like that because I could interact. So a little life lesson that doesn't seem important but helps later on in life. But the big ones were things like learning how to save, um, learning how to manage your time effectively. And, and I learned a lot from Ryan's dad and then later on different folks along the way that taught me a lot of valuable lessons. And so what we're trying to do with Stafford Food Security now is take some of those lessons and pass them on to people because what people don't understand is when you live in an impoverished community, things that you might take for granted, they don't know. You know, because people always ask me like, well, why do you have to feed these people? Can't they figure out how to make their food stamps last a month? No. Uh, you also has to start to look at if they're there, they're there for a reason. Right. And it's not, and, and before anyone thinks that, that I'm saying that they're, they're there because they're stupid or something <laughs> like that, that's not what I'm saying. No, There's an happened. underlying cause to what it is, whether they don't know how to do it. They, you know, we always look at our kids. Yeah. Our kids don't know what they're doing until we teach them how to do it. That's right. And if no one's there to help assist you, I mean, you just talked about it yourself. Yeah. You know, the assistance that you got, mm -hmm. you know, I told you before the show, we were talking about things that we learned. And we learned my dad or from my great uncle about how you do things. Right. Without that, you're just walking into walls. But, you know, you take someone like me, though, like my parents couldn't have taught me that stuff because they didn't know. Yeah. Their parents didn't teach them. So that's how the cycle of poverty starts, right? You're born into poverty. You see how your parents live. And you either make a determination at one point or another that I don't want to live like this anymore or you just keep doing what they did. And I made the decision that I didn't want to live like that. And so I sought out people that could teach me these things. I was talking with someone recently and they said, you know, a great example is when I went to buy a house, you know, the first thing I did was I called my dad and I said, hey dad, I want to buy a house, what do I do? Like, well, what do you do if your dad's never bought a house before and doesn't know anything about that? You know, does, do you, you don't have anybody to tell you, hey, go talk to a banker and get pre-qualified and look at interest rates and then, you know, look, talk to a realtor and, you, Get the home appraised. Or, yeah. Or have, you, have somebody have you, have you do a walkthrough. So you, many things that we just don't know that we don't know. Uh, it, it's, you're, you're, you're speaking, you're, you're preaching the choir. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the number one thing that we've seen here mm -hmm. is they don't know. Yeah. And then more importantly, 
if they do ask, in some cases, they're shamed. Yes, absolutely. Hey, that was good enough for me. What do you mean? And it's not because they're saying that because it was good enough for them. Mm-hmm. Because they're embarrassed about the fact they don't know. Yeah. And so it just creates a, this... It, it, I mean, we, I hate to say it. I mean, that embarrassment feature mm-hmm. or that fear factor. Well, that, that keeps you from asking for help. Exactly. You know, so, yeah. so I mean, you're like, well, why don't they ask for help? Because like, there's a pride factor there. And that's why at Stafford Food Security, it's so important to us that we maintain dignity. Now, I, you know me. I don't soft sell anything. I don't yeah. sugarcoat anything. I'm not trying to give anybody diabetes, you know. But when you come in, I'm going to treat you with dignity and respect. And if I can help you, I will help you. It, but... We don't make anyone feel inferior for that. I, mean, I actually had someone in the office recently, and, and uh, you know, he was very ashamed to be asking for help. And the first thing I said to him is, it's like, you know what, God bless you for asking for help. Because when I was a kid, my dad was too proud to ask for help. Mm-hmm. So guess what happened? We went hungry. So I said, you're at least doing what you need to do for your family. And it takes courage to do that. Absolutely. I mean, and, and that's the, the part. You know, we, we look at pride versus courage. Mm-hmm. I think it takes an immense amount of courage to admit you don't know something mm-hmm. at thir- 25, 35, 45, 55. Mm-hmm. And it takes courage to reach out. Um, you know, now, the other part that I think it's important about you is you don't take any crap. I don't. <laughs> I'm so, kind of famous for that. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I don't want to mean that. I don't want anyone to, I don't want anyone to take that and say, think that this means that, oh, my God, you know, he's, you know, uh, what Arlie Emery, you know, doing the whole, you know, uh, the whole Full Metal Jacket routine with yeah. everybody. But you do hold people accountable. Yeah. You know, you don't mind helping, but they have to participate in trying to get better. Yeah. I mean, so the Arlie Army is a great example. Um, I, I do definitely have that. But it's it's a respect thing, right? So if I just say, you know what? Go ahead and lie to me. Go ahead and do whatever you do. That's not me respecting you. I mean, it, no, we're we're playing a game at that point. Exactly. Like, okay, who's who's you know? Yeah, we, and you yeah. can't. Do, that's where I think where so many groups fail, is they think that their job is to accept the story, mm-hmm. accept the excuse, and just give. Yeah. Now, whereas we want to help, we want to help people grow. We want to help people build. Now, we don't. I don't put any requirements on there saying like, "Oh, the only way I'm going to give you food is if you go through my indoctrination plan." It's not like that. We'll put it out there. You know, hey, I've got this class. You know, I'm going to teach you financial. Literacy. Like, we're going to do these financial peace classes coming up here very soon. A Dave Ramsey program. I'm, I'm going to have five sponsorships available for people. I only want people to be there if they want to be there. That's the only way it's going to work. Absolutely. It doesn't do any good. Yeah. Um, you can't force feed knowledge to people. Um, but we can we can put little pieces out there and we can hope that people take it. And I don't have rose-colored glasses, Tim. I'm, I'm a realist. I know that a lot of people won't take that help. They would rather just get something for free. Um, now, those aren't the people that we usually work yeah, with. But that's not, yeah, but that's not... Yeah, that's <laughs> so. not that's, that was kind of where I was going with, yeah. is that you know, you're going to sit there and ask the, qu- the hard questions. Okay. Hey, are you doing this? No, are you doing this? And, and no one wants to hear that like 15 times. Sure. They're just going to try to go on to the next one that's just going to give. Yeah. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big distinction. Now, you're also, now we've talked about, you know, the, the troubles with teachers and learning and we, the, how do we get the meals to kids and, and how do we find them. Uh, we had mental health experts on not too long ago and they were talking about just the, the, the growing problem that's happening in the in these schools because p- some parents just aren't equipped to be 24-7 yeah. daycare providers. I mean, we forget how much of an important that little break is when the kids are at school for, all, for, for everyone in that regard. But that creates a unique problem for you because your program is designed about giving them food for, at the school system. Right. That's how you're finding them. Yeah. Now they're not in that area. So w- what are you doing to reach out? So we're working a couple of different ways. Um, the first thing we're doing is uh, our teachers are engaging with most of the population through the virtual learning. So um, I'm actually in the process of putting together some instructional videos on how uh, teachers can still try to identify some of the symptoms of the kids. I mean, number one, if, if the kid's not coming, that, that's a pretty good indicator that something's going on there. You know, it might be something to look into. Um, but hopefully through their virtual interactions, you know, the kids still have an opportunity to ask for help because that's, that's what I love about kids, man. Kids don't have filters. 
I mean, <clears throat> they do have a little bit of pride as they start to get older, but especially the younger ones, they don't even have that going on. They're just like, we don't have any food in our house. You know, they'll just tell you. Um, like, oh, wait a minute. And no, then, pride hasn't kicked in. Yet. Yeah, no. So, um, but, and then there's some follow-up questions that go that, well, like, what do you mean there's no food in the house? Well, we had potato chips for dinner last night. Well, like, did you have potato chips because that was all that was there or because that's what you eat. wanted? Yeah. You know? So there's some, there's still some filtering criteria to go on there, but um, but you can pick up on some of those uh, those those indicators, and so I'm hopeful that teachers, by doing the virtual classes, kids will ask for help. Uh, we're also publicizing. Uh, we've become a lot more public than we were originally. When we started out, we very much were a behind-the-scenes organization. Uh, I've been pushing a lot of social media and advertising campaigns out there to let people know that they can that they can ask for help. But what we do is they don't come directly to us. I still want them to go through the school because. Again, that relationship between the school and the family is really what we're trying to build there. They're not going to build, they're going to, some of them will build relationships with Stafford Food Security, but that's not what we're here for. We want to enable the schools to build those relationships because at the end of the day, if I can feed a kid, that kid can focus and he can learn. And then that kid can learn and then he can go out and become a productive member of society. So there's a, there's a, there's a larger thing at work there than just handing them a meal. But back to the point, I wondered, I, I apologize for that. Um, Working with the, the schools, they can now let me know. Once that family reaches out and asks for help and uh, the school gets permission to contact from the family, then we'll go out and we'll take them groceries. We're delivering every, we're al almost every day. Uh, it slowed down a little bit over the summer. I think it's going to pick up again in the fall. But like March and April and May, right after COVID started, we were running deliveries every day. And so what we're doing is we're taking those meals that we usually put in a backpack I'll box up about a week's worth of them. We'll add some extra stuff in there if we know they can't get to the school lunches. We're delivering about a week's worth of groceries to families, and we're doing that Spotsy, King George, Fredericksburg, and Stafford. Um, and that's, that's one way that we can get food to people. The other thing that we started doing back in uh, late April, early May was I was making one of these grocery deliveries, and I went out into a trailer park that I didn't even know existed. It was in Spotsy County. Um, and I was delivering, I was like, wow, I guarantee there's more than one family in here that's hungry right now. And so I reached out to a family that lived, that was outside, his mom and her kids were outside. And I said, hey, he's got hungry people here? They're like, yeah. And I said, I said, well, if I brought, came in and did a big cookout, would you help me get people to it? And so uh, that was actually our second cookout that we did. We came in and we did a, a huge cookout and we fed about 250 people. Just no questions asked. We, we focus it on the neighborhood. It's what I call my artillery approach, right? Mm -hmm. So our backpack's like our sniper shot. We find one family that needs help, boom, we send food there, small, small impact. But now my artillery shot is I can cover a whole neighborhood. And I, I talked to you earlier in the year when I, I said, I need a grill, and I was coming up with a grill. Um, and, and now we, we've been doing it all summer long. We've fed over, just on the cookouts alone, we've fed over 8,000 people this summer um, doing these cookouts. And we, we go to neighborhoods where there's pockets of poverty, right? So maybe it's a Section 8 housing neighborhood, or it's a trailer park, or um, wherever the schools help me identify a lot of these places. Last night we were up in Garrison Woods um, and I had the staff from Kate Waller Barrett out there with me helping me feed kids. Tuesday we did, we did one with Moncure. So what I'll do at these events is I'll come in, I'll set up a tent, I'll set up the grill uh, to be safe because of COVID. We're not letting people gather. We're not, you know, tr we're not encouraging people to, to, to gather. We'll do a to-go box and I'll grill up hamburgers and hot dogs, throw some baked beans in there, some potato chips and a soda. And then I, uh, the table at St. George has been phenomenal. Every week they send me produce orders. So I get fresh apples, bananas, and oranges. And so I'll take that stuff out there with me and, and we'll feed hundreds of people at a shop. So um, that has been tremendous for us as another way to reach families outside of them being in the school. Now, when you were in the Marine Corps, were you in the, were you a cook in the Marine Corps? No, no. I was a straight up infantryman for seven years. Uh, okay. I, just, I was just thinking about that. I'm like, going, to, are, did, are, did, are, did, are we, did you get in trouble a lot where you were working in the kitchen? Uh, no, no. no? Yeah. That's kind of an old, old school thing. Um, I, I, we don't really have KP duty anymore. But I think uh, part of what might have led to that, uh, so I was an infantryman first, and then I moved over to intelligence analysis. And in intelligence analysis, we evaluate the threat, and we learn everything there is to know about the threat. And then with my infantry side, I, it's what we call the, the integration of intel and ops, right? So learn about the enemy, and then know how to apply resources to destroy it. So the way I run Stafford Food Security is using military planning strategies. My enemy is hunger. I have studied hunger, I have studied Stafford County, I have studied and learning more about Spotsy and King George in these areas that we're growing into. 
and man, I just aggressively attack it, and I'm looking to kill it everywhere I can find it. Um, it's a little violent for some of your viewers. No, I but, mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think it takes, I think it, I think it takes a, a commitment like that, and even a thought process. Yeah. You know, it, it is, it's a dangerous thing. It's something that 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 is a, I mean, it, it robs a community of its life. Absolutely, it, it truly does. How many hours do you do this a day? Oh man. <laughs> Because it's not just you, it's it's other people, yeah. but it's you and your wife. Yeah. How many hours are you committing to this every day or every week? I mean, I, I'm. it's hard to count them. Uh, I tell you, recently I've had to cut back a little bit. I, I've gotten very jealous of my weekends because I need to spend more time with my family. Um, so we're not doing the weekends anymore. But Monday through fr well, when I say that, I'm still doing planning and making phone I'm, calls. You're not that. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, why I'm, that's why I'm saying that. I don't know. Um, I, so right now what I do, I telework for, for Dogma. So I set up my office uh, at, at, our, at our headquarters. So I get my work done. I'm usually st I start work anywhere from between 4 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Get my, get my paying job, right? Because i got to make sure my family is taken care of and make sure I can pay the bills. Um, so between 6 and 12, 6 and 2, somewhere around there, I'm getting my stuff done at Dahlgren. Um, and then in the meantime, though, what I do, people always ask me, like, how do you do what you do? I don't waste time. So if I'm sending emails out for my Dahlgren work and then I'm waiting for somebody to respond or maybe the network's down or I got something going on, then I'm jumping over to another computer and I'm ordering fruit for next week or I'm ordering meat for next week. So there are no wasted minutes in my schedule. I constantly have something going on. And with today's technology, it, it's so much easier because even if I'm you know, sitting out in the, in the waiting room somewhere, I've got my cell phone, which is a portable computer and I can get work done or I can do social media advertising or something. So I just, I don't waste any time. But um, people always ask me like, do you sleep? And I'm like, yeah, anywhere from four to six hours a day, you know? I mean, I think the, the idea of sleeping eight to ten hours a day is, is is insane to me because like you could be doing other things, you know. So well, yeah, um, there's plenty of time to sleep later, right? That's right. You know? uh, you know, so, well, but I wanted to ask about yeah. the time that you're doing because you do have a family. I do. Now your wife is involved. Mm -hmm. Met her. She's as committed to this, I think, as you are, mm -hmm. uh, which is commendable for both of you. But your kids. Yep. So it is a traditional family. It's not. No kids. This is no, all I do. No, no, no. I'm bored. This is my job. You know. So you do have the same trials and tribulations of homework, mm -hmm. after school activity ish, after school activities. You've got summer activities. Mm -hmm. You've got vacations. You know. So you've got that every date night with the, with your wife. We're doing all it tonight. Of, <laughs> all of those things that need to happen. Yep. Yeah. But you're still doing this. Sure. You know. Does it take that whole family to be on board with you for this to happen? Yeah, you know, I think it does. Um, the great thing is um, I love doing this with my family. I mean, I have people tell me all the time, like, yeah, I would love to do more volunteer work, but I need to spend time with my family. I'm like, dude, you can volunteer and spend time with your family at the same time. And the best part about it is is that your kids learn that giving is back to the community is, is so important, right? So, so when we do our events, uh, you know, I'll have – my kids are there. Most of my kids are grown now. My three oldest are grown, but we still have Emily at home. Um, but Emily comes to the events with us. Emily knows our packing system inside and out. When you see her at packing events, she'll be running around like, no, 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 that, put the cans on the bottom. Put the fruit, and, and the kids are like, why is this kid telling me what to do? Because mm -hmm. she's been to so many of them, she knows what's going on. Um, and I think really uh, that, that was a, a balance that I came up with early on. People are like, well, how do you spend time with your family? Like, I spend time with my family and we serve at the same time because what's the I mean what are we gonna go but they have to buy into this oh yeah absolutely I mean and that's the part that you know we all know what it's like corralling our kids sometimes <laughs> yeah right. it's easier to, you know I was saying it's easier to put jello on a wall and make it stick with a nail than sometimes <laughs> to corral them our kids right so you know your your children have bought into this yeah absolutely and and then I'll ask about this so when you met your wife mm -hmm. Were you doing this at the time? Oh, no. No, no, no. I mean, Amy and I have been together since I was uh, 19, and she was 17. So we've been together forever. So she she bought into the vision. You know, you told her your story and, and all of that? <laughs> or was there some selling? There was that? some selling, yeah. I'm a salesman first and foremost. Um, so, um, no, it really started out with, I mean, we both love kids, right? So we mm -hmm. both have a soft spot for kids. Um, I, I guess I'll share a, a separate story that might help make some of this make sense. Um, I suffer from PTSD. Um, I, I've done a number of combat deployments, um, and but my PTSD is a little bit different than what most people think of. First of all, I have no regrets for anything that I ever did. I'm right with God, and, and so that's not an issue. But 
I became so used to working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and, and working at what we call an op tempo, an operations tempo, where it's go, 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 go. Um, when I came home after my first deployment and I went back to working in an office or just doing the daily mundane things, I, I almost lost my mind because nothing matters. Um, and this is something that I've talked about with some of my veteran friends is, you know, I mean, when you're like, hey, Tim, I need your sales report, you know, I'm like, this is shit. Nobody's dying because of a sales report, mm -hmm. you know. I was doing something that was so much more important for so long. I mean, literally was handling life and death stuff that I came back and my, my regular mundane job just didn't matter to me. And so if I sit still for five minutes, then the depression starts to come in. Then the stuff starts to come in. So I need to be busy all the time. Um, so what I realized a few years ago was what I really need to do is channel my energy. I haven't... I've been accused of having an abundance of energy. I'm sure you no, no, no. <laughs> so what I have to do is I have to channel it. And so the way I deal with my PTSD and what I try to encourage a lot of my friends to do who struggle with PTSD is you need a mission. We, we were geared to have a mission. We were trained to have a mission. And so when I came home, and I mean, for me to do a nine to five job, that's, that's easy. That's 33% of my day accounted for. Now what do I do with the other 6%? I needed a mission. And so I picked feeding kids as my mission. Um, and, and that's why I, I attack it so aggressively because that's how I, that's how I it's, stay it's, sane. It's, it's, it's amazing <laughs> that you, how, you fra how you phrased your PTSD uh, as an employer mm -hmm. who has actively sought out and, and tried to recruit from the military. There are certain, and I, I don't want to, I won't go too specific on it, but there's certain people who when they leave, never transition mm -hmm. very well in, into the into this these roles and i think a lot of what you just said really kicks in my mind now about where really where their problem was it mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily job or whatever but when you're looking at i'm making these types of decisions on a daily basis mm -hmm. and now i'm in these types of decisions yeah this is boring. Right. And I don't want to say it's boring, although it's more exciting. It's still important. Yeah, but it's it, but still it, important. But it is an example of just what's the point. Right. And so there, there has to be a, a transition in there. Um, and, and, I, and I still struggle with it a little bit. Like today, I mean, my boss was, er, I mean, I, we have like an emergency at work. And in the back of my head, I'm like, this is not an emergency. This is, I mean, like no one's going to die if we don't do this. But it is still important. It does still need to get done. Um, so it's all a sense of scale that everybody has to personally adjust no, yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, you know? no, you're, you're right. It is, uh, a, it is a, in, in, no matter what in life, it's always a sense of scale. Like, to your point, oh, this is an emergency. Right. And you start putting it through the, the filter <laughs> gun. Is, you know, it? Yeah. is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is um, it? But in that industry or in that situation, yes, it could, yeah. could, could very well be an emergency. One of my favorite sayings is, uh, don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. And the follow-up saying, it's all small it's stuff. It's all small stuff. <laughs> except yeah, for and, 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 it, and it really is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, except, well, it's funny. We were talking, I was talking to someone about raising their kids. When we say about, you know, priorities, you know, you know your first child's born and, and, you know, oh, my God, you got to wrap them in yes. bubble wrap. <laughs> that third child's born, and they're eating dirt, and you're like going, okay. <laughs> be right. they'll, they'll be okay. Be right. you know. Go ahead, put that fork in the light socket. Exactly. We'll they'll do it only once. We'll they'll, they'll only do it one time. <laughs> um, you, know, you mentioned about the people you're, you're, you're taking care of. You don't keep records. Uh, so to the extent of, it's not like people are going to come to you, and now their name's going to be on a database yeah, no. of, okay, now I'm going to be, you know. So it's not, you know, you're, you're, this is truly a, an opportunity for people to come in with that dignity. Absolutely, yeah. I don't share our information with anybody. Um, that's cost me some money, actually. Uh, people, oh, have, yeah. I've had organizations that have offered to donate money to me and said, but then you have to report. And I'm like, nope. Um, we're very much a no strings attached. Uh, I mean, we're a nonprofit. We need donors, we need money. But I won't take it if it comes with strings. And that's one of the reasons why we don't take any government funding. Um, one, because I believe that as a community, we should take care of our own community. I don't think we need a government fix for everything. That's my, my small government spiel for the podcast. Um, but we can do it ourselves. Now, I do keep records as far as I need to be... I personally hold myself to a very high standard to account to my donors to say, here's where your money went. No, with that part I understand. Mm -hmm. But I, I was kind of going to lead back into the government part of mm -hmm. it. You're not bound by these regulations because you're not taking this. That's right. Out. I mean, and then I say these regulations are bad 
But, They're needed. But the problem is that they do impact the ability to give. Yes, they put constraints upon you um, in what you can do. So, I mean, I talk to a lot of organizations that are like, yeah, we can't do that because it has to be this, this, and this. We have, I, I keep things so that we can be as flexible as possible. So when there's a need, we can bump out and do it. Um, recently, I was working with one of the schools, and their nutritional, their nutrition director has all of these rules he has to go by. And I'm like, okay, cool. Do that within all of your rules. Do what you got to do. I'll take care of the other stuff because I'm not going to get in trouble with anybody. The only person I have to answer to are my donors, mm -hmm. you know, and the IRS. Um, and we make sure that yeah, we, we do yeah, both we of those do. things, you know. Um, so we have the flexibility to do some things that, that some organizations can't do because we structured ourselves that way very carefully. Um, my board is 100% behind me. Um, they all are fully vested in what we do. So um, some organizations get so big that and they get these big boards and then the boards, you know, uh, it's not a, it's it's not a, yeah, it's not, and it's not, a, it's a board for people who want to give, not people who think they're going to get, they're going right. to get reimbursed. That's right. I want to go back to when you founded this. Okay. And the reason I want to go back to when you founded it is because of uh, uh, understanding I have between you and a few of your other friends. Mm -hmm. You started this when your kids were at Conway, is that correct? Yep. Yep. Emily was at Conway at the time and my wife was working there. And you had support from the principal there. Yeah. Well, he was my guinea pig, right? Uh -huh. So so JR, is, he's, he's a good dude. Uh, we've become good friends over the years. Um, I originally started... Uh, I've always been a big believer in giving back. And I got to know JR because uh, I wanted to volunteer in the school. And typically, you know, they don't get a lot of dad volunteers. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's always mom's thing, yeah. right? And I will say, first of all, you know, you talked earlier about like how you deal with balance in sports and extra. Amy carries 90% of that weight. I mean, that's that's what frees me up to do these things. I mean, she's phenomenal at that kind of stuff. Um, I still try to get to the games whenever I can, but a lot of times she's the one running Emily where she needs to go and, and doing what she needs to do. Uh, but. So I went to JR, and, and we, I'd volunteered for, and done a few things for the school in the past, and I said, hey, man, look, you got hungry kids at Conway? I know most people think Conway's a pretty well-to-do school. He says, no, we definitely have a few hungry families here. I said, well, I want to do something about it. I said, here's what I want to do, and I laid out what I wanted to do. And uh, he, said, he said, you can do whatever you want. He said, that's awesome. Go nuts. And uh, so he was the one that kind of opened the door to let us experiment and try to do what we wanted to do. And then next thing you know, it caught on like gangbusters. So yeah, I mean, Jr. was he, he doesn't say no, you know. Do you think that that made a difference? Because when you start to go into other areas, I know that when we try to work with some other people, mm -hmm. you get these, you get, you get a lot of this. Yeah, listen, the leadership at the schools makes every difference. Um, I was talking with someone recently, and they asked me, you know, like, what's your neediest school, or what's your, or what school do you give the most backpacks to? And I was like, you know, ironically, those two things don't correlate. The neediest school may not be the one that we provide the most support to, because what it really boils down to is how well that administration works with us, right? And schools are like people. They're all different, right? I have, uh, uh, we work with 66 different schools right now. There are some of them that I should be giving a lot more support to, but I don't have the relationship yet with that staff to where they know that they, I mean, even though I say the door's open, ask me for anything. If I can't do it, I'll tell you, and if not, then I'll find somebody who can. Different people lead in different ways, and I have about six schools right now that I just have the utmost respect for, for the principals there because they work closely with me. It doesn't mean I don't respect my other principles. It's just different levels of engagement, right? And JR is one of that, those people that will bend over backwards for the families at Conway. And there are other ones out there. And then there are some that are focused more on the education aspect of school, or maybe they have a different focus. Um, so I'm, I, I don't want to disparage any of those people. No, I, no I'm not uh, saying for that, that. I'm more saying it from the standpoint that I think it's, and it, it needs to be said that Conway, for some reason, JR mm -hmm. has been a great little microcosm for, or, 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 or is added gasoline yeah. to quite a lot of efforts. I just, because I, I, the reason why I'm, where I'm going with this is without that type of support, mm -hmm. do you think you'd be where you are today? Well, I mean, probably not because, you know, you got to get you got to get that first mm -hmm. step out the door, right? If JR had been like, yeah, no, we're not interested. We don't want to do that here. I might have just said, okay, forget it. It was a dumb idea and, and, and not have pushed any farther, right? Um, but because he said yes and then other schools then wanted to get on board, it definitely, you know, we all need that why not rolled, guy, right? We need that yeah, why not person. That's right. Yeah, why not? The, yeah, the, why not? The guy that says yes instead of, well, I don't know, you know, and and 
so his open he and I talked about it because you know I've talked about this before and I talked to JR afterwards he's like he's like dude I don't deserve credit for anything I didn't do anything I was like y you said yes when you could have said no and, it's and very that's easy important. To say no. that's it's right very easy. no is so it's easy, easy. Yes. no no has no strings no has no risk yep. N yep. no I mean you know it's and it is but, but let's be fair it is it is a lot to Absolutely. open up your school it's trust it, it is a huge trust yep. But it's also a belief in the mission. And, yeah. I, and I think that's the other part that's just important to mention about that. Because when people are out here looking about doing something, because they want to do something like, like mm -hmm. you are, whether there's a group they want to join or there's an idea they want to do on their own, they need to find those, those supporters, those cheerleaders, mm -hmm. those yeah. initial people to help boost them up. Where else could you find those people when, when you were looking for your board and those people that are supporting you? You know, it's a church. Uh, my church got right behind it and was uh, incredibly supportive of it. Um, and then once it got rolling, I mean, we, we picked up a ton of chairs. I guess that'd be my biggest advice to people is just find one to start with and more will come. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, you've become a great supporter and a cheerleader for the organization. Um, and you and churches, they... I, I don't know where they come from. I guess God sends y'all. I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would love to tell you that we're a huge cheer. I mean, I, I, we love what you do. I, I, you know, we don't, I, I'm going to take the whole JR approach. We don't do anything. You know, we, all yeah. we did is say. We're all humble, right? Oh, well, no, it's not humble. It's, it's true. <laughs> like, we had said, you know, why not? Because yeah. it, doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't hurt for us to say, sure, why not? Where you guys are able to come in and, and you know, the men, and, I mean, we had one of your events. Mm -hmm. the the men and women who you have working there who are supporters I mean I've been to your facility we're not talking a garage you know we're, we're talking real people really engaged you know there was tons of food out there and the care that was going on and, yeah. and the boards that you have about how to put it together mm -hmm. and, and this is what's going on yes you do have a you do have it via very much military efficiency. <laughs> I think there was some, you know, it'll, you, you'll have everything packed by 0830. It was on the, no, I'm just kidding yeah. about that part. But I mean, you know, and the, and the drill sergeant. at you if you put the wrong The drill sergeant the hat that you have in there was a little over the top. <laughs> but it's all possible. And in today's age of everything going wrong in the world. Yeah. Or it appears. Let's back it up. Yeah, it's not that it's bad. It's not that yeah. bad. I mean, but it just, uh, but every time you turn around, it's, it's, it's this, it's that. It's only a hill if you decide to make it a hill. That's right. And, and, you, and you should be commended on that. Well, thank you. You're looking for a food truck. Yes. So So let's talk about, I mean, you know, you're not trying to go out there and be Stafford Food Security selling tacos no, or something. No. What, are, what are we talking about? So I actually had this idea a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it, a food truck is a mobile way to feed kids. You know, it, it's 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 something I wanted to do a couple of years ago and we, early on we tried to do it but it was just a bridge too far back then but we are at a point now where basically this grill that I bought this summer that we've been going around and feeding people uh, it was kind of like my compromise for a food truck and in three and a half months now we've fed over 8,000 people with that grill if I had a food truck I could triple those numbers because a food truck will, number one, it's a portable kitchen, so I can do more than just burn hot dogs and hamburgers on a grill, right? I can, I can deep fry, I can do all these different things. Um, what's killing me on the food packing event, uh, the, the, the cookouts right now is I pull it behind my truck, and then some of these events I'm feeding five or 600 people. And now you've got to take food for five or 600 people, and my truck is only so big, which I gotta talk to you about getting a bigger truck, but we'll talk later. Um, so, um, I can only fit so much in the truck. But I've got a friend of mine, Tony Steptoe, they, his family just bought a food truck and they're doing an, an awesome family run food truck venture. But he's he also donates a lot of time to us and, and he's a big believer in the organization. Um, and so Tuesday night, he said, I'll bring my truck out and, and I'll deep fry chicken nuggets and french fries and you do the burgers and dogs. And we partnered together and we fed a bunch of kids up in, up in Moncure in North Stafford. But when we loaded his truck up, I could get everything in the truck. I didn't have to take my trailer to my, pull up my enclosed trailer to one spot and then bring the grill another time. So logistically, it's tremendous. But a um, food truck is just a, a way for me to take that food to the people who need it most because that's the gap that's missing right now, Tim. We have these sites where people can come and the schools have places where the kids can come. 
But there are people out there that can't get to these places. They don't have transportation, or they don't know how to get there. Or they don't know that it's there to get to. Well, you, you, you mentioned transportation. We, you know, we had we had the food pantry, uh, one of the food banks on. Yeah. If they can't get there, it doesn't, doesn't do, do any, any good. good. I actually talked to some volunteers from the food bank earlier this year because they called me and they said, you know, we're doing these mobile food pantries, but nobody's coming. And I said, well, send me the list of where you're doing them. And that was the problem right there. So some of the places that they go to, like if I take, let's use Conway Elementary, for example. Conway Elementary. If I put a food truck at Conway Elementary, nobody's coming there because the people that go to Conway that need it are 12 miles away and they can't get to it. So you've got to take the food to these neighborhoods and take it to the people where they need it. You know, it's kind of, a, there's, I think there's a popular phrase called meet them where they are, right? Yeah. It means something completely different, but I take it quite literally. Like if you live in Old Forge and I have food, I'm going to bring the food to Old Forge. So then you step out your door and then boom, there's the food. So that's what I want to do with more of these mobile feeding adventures. Now the grill has been awesome. But I got to tell you, as tough a guy as I am, where I stop being tough is when it gets cold. <laughs> so as we come into October Oh, you leave November, the Marine Corps now, now uh, there's a problem? Yeah, you know, there's a reason why we fight wars in warm climates. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so. yeah you let the Army do their stuff in the cold weather. That's, that's right. That's yeah. right. Um, you know, it's when you, when you look at getting a food truck, mm -hmm. would a trailer work? Um, again, same problem, right? What can I fit into the trailer? Now well, I have, it's a food I, trailer. Like the, like I'm tracking. Okay. But they're typically not as big as a food truck, right? So a, a 29 foot food truck has the kitchen, has storage space, has the everything I need in it. I mean, if a, if a trailer were that big and I could pull it with my truck, mm -hmm. that would absolutely work. Well, yeah. if you buy the new truck, it would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good move. I see what you yeah, did see there. That, I see yeah, what that you did out. there. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm no. kidding about that. So. You know, it, you, when you mentioned about the food and take it to them, a really good point is to keep in mind one of the problems in in how the how we set up the world is where grocery stores are. Yeah, absolutely. And there are situations where grocery stores are not in where they need to be. Where they need to be, and mm -hmm. people are forced to buy food at a convenience store at two times the price yep. because grocery stores don't want to be in certain parts of the of the community. And that's probably, the, those are the parts that need these efforts brought into it for, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's another important point. And, and people, if you, if you don't see it, you needed to go through and drive through economic, some economically yeah, depressed areas. If you areas. get out into the northern neck, you'll see some of it. There's yeah. not much of it right here around. Where, I mean, around here, it's like you can't throw a cat without hitting a grocery store. But as you get out into there's, King George there, there's are, there are Marshall's. areas where grocery stores have closed. Yeah. And if you look at where they're at, I mean, there's some... You know, or the grocery store doesn't necessarily the close grocery store doesn't fit the demographic. Right. You know, Wegmans is a lot more expensive mm -hmm. than than a, than some of your than an Aldi, yeah. but it's right next to Bragg Hill. Right. You know, uh, so, so when you look at that, I mean, yeah, they can't go down to the Aldi and down over the river and through the woods. But it's less convenient. Right? But it is yeah. less. So and you know, some of those things challenges. But yeah. those, but those, and that's just a small area. Where you look at some of the bigger challenges, because right outside of Bryant Hill is is Seven yeah. Eleven, and you know where are they going to go? Are they going to are they going to walk to nope. that? No, they're not. Yeah. That's so. kind of one of those things too that we're hoping to address with some of our classes is uh, talking to folks about taking the extra step because sometimes just because it's convenient doesn't mean it's the right thing. I actually just had a talk with my daughter recently, and and this is my my dad advice when you hit. Life is all about choices, right? And when you're making choices, there's typically a hard choice and an easy choice. Never take the easy choice. Oh, the easy choice. Well, like, <laughs> I saw my, I, I, I used DoorDash for a little while, and I'm like, going, oh, my God, I can't believe this meal cost me this. Right. Versus, you know, just going and getting up and, and going and picking yeah. up ourselves. The easy choice is seldom the one that you end up wanting to take. Um, I mean, if it makes sense, then great. But, but yeah, so if we can get a food truck, man, um, we can make things happen. Uh, we are at a point now where I, I, we can sustain it, we can grow it, but what we need are we need, we need some team sponsors. I need businesses and, and organizations, and we're gonna raise some money from the individuals too. I know my individual donors always step up. That's a funny thing too. I love my business sponsors. Um, that's why we, we recognize y'all on our wall at the store, and we're gonna put you on the truck too. Um, so Pohanka Nissan Hyundai, right on the yeah, truck. Right on the it's truck. gonna look great too. Right on the truck. Um, but, uh, but our individual donors are still running about half of our support. So I, when I talk to, or, I, there's another nonprofit, I won't drop their names, um, 
good friend of mine uh, that ran that, he uh, he said, you're always getting the nickel and dime stuff. He goes, you need to go big. And I'm like, man, that nickel and dime stuff adds up. I mean, because I can spend weeks trying to get a $5,000 donation from an organization, and I or I can get 50 people to donate $100 or 500 people to donate $10, you know? Um, Stafford, Fredericksburg, the surrounding area has been great about those individual donations. And that's really an amazing thing because one person, $10 doesn't seem like a lot. My $10 isn't going to make a difference in the world. But when we multiply that, you think about, I don't even remember what the population is of this area right now. But about 250000 Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So if everybody gave $10, you put a zero behind that now, it's $2.5 million. Well, you're, you're, the, thing that, the thing that you're able to do, though, and this is the most important thing, is you're making, you're, you're getting, you're get, I don't want to say you're getting by, but you're taking that, that dollar you get mm -hmm. has to be, you have to get three dollars. Oh, of we value squeeze out. it, shake it. Yeah, yeah. we do. Where some everything people, but copy it. We're not supposed to do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Super dollars. Um, <laughs> but when you look at other groups, that's not what they do. Mm -hmm. You know. The overhead that you have doesn't go to pay salaries. No. It doesn't go to pay, because even your building is... I have to pay for the building. But it's but it's not at full retail. No, I got it for half retail. So, you know, you, so you're, you, so you're, again, you're <laughs> making that dollar work. Absolutely. But those are the things that some people don't realize, is there's a lot of groups out there. Uh, there's one very popular one that once they went through and they found out how much money was going into salaries and wages yeah. and advertising there's not much help going out. And those aren't the ones that people, you know, you want to give it, give to. Yeah. So giving to a group like yourself, that dollar really does get turned into three just because of how well you're able to multiply it. Absolutely. I mean, some of the things that, that I'll think, you know, first I want to tell people, like, when you donate to me, I take it very personally. I mean, I, I, I it's a trust. Like, you trust me with your money, I'm going to put it to good use. I take that very personally. And we're very transparent about it, too. We, 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 that's why people, and somebody asked me one time, like, you're always posting on Facebook all the stuff you're doing. Well, you should stop bragging. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not bragging. In fact, I try to stay out of most of the shots. Yeah, I'm justifying it. I want, you, I want the public to see, you know, hey, you, know, you gave me X amount of dollars last month. You gave me $3,000 last month. Here's where I'm putting it to work. And guess what? If you give me 3000 more, Here's what I could do with it. Well, know? and the other part so, is that people need to know that you're there. Absolutely. And I and you, and you, Tim, you, your wife, your family, the group out there, can't say enough. Thank you guys you. do an incredible work. We will work with you on your food truck. That's not a problem. <laughs> um, we'll get you in the Christmas tree challenge. We'll, we'll get yeah, some, we'll I can't get, wait for that. We'll we're going to win this year. But uh, trying to figure out how we're going to win all the categories. Well, <laughs> you got to go through April first. <laughs> You gotta go through April and the team at the Marshall School, and those are two difficult ones to beat. So, so yeah, I don't want to have to buy the Marshall School's tree again this year, but uh, I loved their tree last year. April, I'm just gonna sabotage her early on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to use that military intelligence to find out what she's doing. So, so if April disappears between now and you know the Christmas tree challenge, just nobody worry. We'll release her after the Christmas tree challenge. Well, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if she's locked in the RV or something like that. <laughs> Don't tell but, him where uh, I'm going to put her. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, we well, well the problem is if that happens, then Morgan would lose his mind. So, we, we, uh, you got, yeah, we, we got to look out for Morgan Sanders. He's hanging bit. on by a thread anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> Plus, think about this. If we have him at the gala without April to stop him from bidding, think oh, of how much we can get him the, to spend. I thought of that. I mean, that's... And a little bit of just a little See? liquid courage, and he's done. So in case anybody thinks I was talking about anything nefarious, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to like find like a condo in Tahiti and send Amy and April there well, that, for the yeah. next three months. And, and it's then, a vacation. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Tim, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. We're going to be – we'll put your information on the – on. It's, it's been on the web – it's been on the uh, screen for you. Cool. Uh, I will tell you that if you do – give money to this group. You're giving it to a great group of people. Uh, if you want to donate some time, he'll be glad to take your time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he does have a very specific list of items that you need food-wise if you'd like to donate that. We'll include that list here as well. Sure. Um, not to say that he wouldn't take anything that you have, yeah. but because his meals are designed to be dignified and they're and prideful, it's very specific items that you get, mm -hmm. and which is great as opposed to just you know canned, canned, canned peaches and, and whatnot. 
um, beans all around and things. You know, I, I think that's a, it's an important distinction. Yeah. I really love the fact that you worry about people's pride. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's and, and, and d dignity and bring that into it because that's the way to bring them forward is to make them feel like they're part of something positive, not something negative. You guys do an amazing job. Couldn't be prouder to be uh, affiliated with you all. Consider you a great friend. Glad to be here to help you. But thank you for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Happy to be here. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Fredericksburg Strong Podcast. Be sure to visit fredericksburgstrong.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content, as well as submit a request for you or your organization to appear on one of our future episodes. See you next time with another exciting episode of Fredericksburg Strong.